Hello! Welcome to an adventure. Uh, I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, and this is Archival Adventures, um, <clears throat> streaming live from the Archives and Special Collections at Virginia Tech uh, to both the twitch.tv slash BTUL Studios and twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Welcome, everybody. Uh, hi, Key Squared. How are you today? Um, so, the plan today is we're going to look at some holiday stuff. Uh, we start the stream every week by uh, reading the Virginia Tech uh, Land Acknowledgement and Labor Acknowledgement. <laughs> I do. I am wearing um, the ugly Christmas sweater from Alex the Honking Bird. Uh, so, um, yeah. Hi, Fluidan. How are you today? Uh, all right. I'm going to go ahead and read the, the thing real quick, and then we'll get into the introductions. Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples, <clears throat> and other Native nations, we commit to share, changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Utprosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, read that uh, statement from the university at the top of every stream. I think it is important to <clears throat> actually pay attention to those acknowledgments. Oh, 16-Bit Eric, thank you so much for bringing the whimsies over. Welcome, Adventures of Tony. Welcome, I am Puddleglum, Rykar01. Eric, uh, thank you so much for coming in. Um, it's always good to have you all here, and, and it's fun to have you join. Uh, so today's, uh, today we're exploring the archives looking for items that are holiday related. Um, our archives mostly has Christmas related things. It's not a focus of our collection, um, but for like midwinter holidays, we mostly have Christmas. Um, I did look for Kwanzaa and Festivus and <laughs> Hanukkah and Yule and like <clears throat> other midwinter holidays and didn't really find a whole lot in our collections. So this will be a mostly Christmas focused uh, stream today. Um, and as you can see, I chose to wear an ugly Christmas sweater or a Christmas jumper. Uh, this is from Alex the Honking Bird, um, who was an inspirational spokesburb uh, <laughs> on Twitter and Instagram. Um, their, uh, their companion, Annika Howells, uh, is from Australia and honestly made tons of people very happy uh, by tweeting and then uh, posting to Instagram and Facebook and YouTube with their bird, Alex the Honk. And uh, so I was quite a fan of Alex the Honk and that's why I have a Christmas jumper from them. Uh, yes, spokesburb. That That is the actual thing. Um, not actually a budgie, Tony. This is a cockatiel. Um, so he was Alex the Honking Bird. Uh, because that was the sound he made. You can still find videos online and the Twitter account is still active with Alex's son, Dominic. Um, Alex passed last year, but Dominic is still going strong and he has his own personality and his own, he, he's less of a spokesburb and more of a um, action movie star. Uh, <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> Uh, definitely worth uh, checking out Alex the Honking Bird if you are not familiar. Um, but yeah, so today I have pulled a number of items from our collections that are related to uh, Christmas, and we're going to take a look at them. Um, there may be singing of parody Christmas carols uh, with a 
roughly political bent from the 1980s and 90s. Um, there may be old Christmas cards, there may be Christmas card design illustrations from architects, uh, possibly some really old Christmas stories for children. Depends on what we get to in the time that we have. Um, and then next week we will be live uh, for our final show of the year. Um, and next week we will have a special guest, and now this week I can actually announce who that special guest will be. Uh, next week joining me on the program will be uh, archivist Kira, who is uh, an archivist here at Virginia Tech as well, and is our expert, our in-house expert on food history and cocktail history, which next week's focus will be holiday cocktails and mocktails. So yes, next week we will have Kira, um, one of my mods, actually joining me on stream uh, to talk about the history of holiday cocktails and to talk us through some uh, non-alcoholic alternatives to holiday cocktails. Um, so yeah, cocktails and mocktails. Uh, so let me go ahead and just double check that actually video is going out live on both channels because I had to preview on one and not on the other. Okay, we're good. Um, Twitch has been having its share of issues today, uh, so do let me know if things get weird. Oh, it's commencement next week. Well, I'm happy that you um, will get to take part in commencement, Key Squared. Uh, but yeah, there will be a VOD available um, on both Twitch channels. The VOD is there for a couple of weeks. And then long-term VODs of all of these shows are available on the Virginia Tech University Library's YouTube channel. Uh, so if you ever miss one and you want to check out what happened, um, you can always go and check it out there. Uh, and then um, after a brief hiatus, uh, while the university is shut down for the holiday break, um, we will be back on January 5th. So we've got one show next week and then back on January 5th. And January 5th, we will be repeating ourselves. So January 6th of last year, we went live for the first ever Archival Adventures, and we did Pulp Science Fiction. And coming up on January 5th, we will be going live with a program on Australian Pulp Science Fiction. So <laughs> returning to Pulp Sci-Fi, but focusing specifically on Australian imprints. So we don't have a lot of them, but I think we can make a whole show out of what we've got. So, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna switch us to document view here. All right. And what I have here to start us off with is items from the Alice Ross Culinary Ephemera Collection, which we have looked at previously. Not these specific items, but we've looked at the collection previously. I'm going to see if I can zoom out at all on the camera. It does not seem that I can. That's okay. For some reason, I... F oh, it might not be up as high as normal. There. <laughs> we set up the camera special every week. So, um, what we have here uh, right now to start off with are these little cards. Uh, most of these are going to be advertising style cards. So let's take a look at some. This one is a postcard. Let's see what it says. Oh, and so we're getting the glare again. Let's zoom in a bit. I will solve this. Yeah, adding more light does not solve the problem. Let me see. One second. I don't think that helped either. It's worth a try, though. 
In the other room, we didn't have these glare issues quite as often. Uh, let me see if I take the camera closer to it, if that helps at all. <laughs> Actually, I do think that bringing the camera closer helped a bit. We're just getting a lot of like really harsh light from our lights in this room and we need something a bit more washed out to do these better. Um, I can try angling it. Actually at an angle, I think it is a little bit easier. Let me get a wedge. <laughs> I want you all to be able to see it. Like this. <laughs> Bear with me. It's a live program. It's not a setup that gets to stay here between programs. So, and you know, over the course of the year, we've gotten better. But we're not perfect. All right. I think that's about as good as it's going to get. Hopefully, you all can see the item. Oh, hurrah for the holiday season. All hail to its puddings and plums. Great blessings upon the dear children for whom this sweet Christmas tide comes. So that's that would be a plum pudding uh, that they're carrying. And this is just an old postcard. Everett. Hope old Santa comes with lots of good things for... Oh, with lots of good things from G and G. B. We know nothing about who this was to or from beyond what's written on the card. It's really hard to see the writing on this one on the camera. I can see it in person, but... Um, but this is just a collection of ephemera, which means, like, things that people would throw away. Um, here's another card. This one has a lovely illustration with the little cart, or a little, a little sled. Uh, looks like with gifts in it, and somebody was apparently gifting pigs. A Merry Christmas to you. Um... A Merry Christmas to Helen from Aunt Addie and no nope. Uncle. I can't read the name and all. It's addressed to Helen. Mots, M-O-T-T-E-S, apparently. So, Christmassy cards. I just thought it would be fun to kind of start with a page of these. There's some, they're mostly pretty sweet in this collection. I've seen some real creepy ones, <laughs> but nothing particularly creepy in our collections here. Um, here's one that, uh, relies upon stereotypes. Uh, as you can see, there is a chubby little blonde boy, uh, assuming boy, just based on um, its reliance on stereotype and how the, how the illustration is dressed, uh, holding what appear to be apples and eating a chocolate. Um, but generally, this would be a very stereotypical way of depicting German children. Um, in the early part of the 1900s, uh, which is my guess as to when this is from. And what's funny is it's a stereotypical way of depicting German children, particularly Bavarian children, and it was printed in Germany. Uh, <laughs> so not only is it stereotypical, it's stereotypical from the country it is a stereotype of but 
a lovely little Christmas card there. Uh, just, just a postcard. It is how Augustus Gloop is depicted in um, uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Let's see what else we have that's particularly interesting. Because I don't want to spend the entire time on these and I tend to get bogged down in the first thing I show. So I'm going to look for really interesting ones. And if I don't see any stupendously spectacular ones, we'll move on to other things and we can always come back to these. Unless you all want to see like all of the cards. Um, But right now I'm looking for anything that is somewhat like unique. And these are not really super unique at the moment. They are older, but I've seen more unique things. <laughs> Let's meet genuine English plum pudding. This one's kind of interesting. Let's look at this one. So here we have an illustration of some children in bed. Let me see if it's better at an angle for you. So the children are in bed, although their bed appears to be partly inside of the fireplace because the stockings are hung by the chimney um, and they're hung that's that's beside the point uh, there's a little candle here and in the smoke there are creatures dancing uh, this is a Christmas greeting from Wilson Spice Company and it says Sandman's coming uh, and there's a, a thin figure here in kind of a um, uh, chevalier type hat with the feather, uh, holding a lantern, walking with a cane, and carrying a big bag over his shoulder. So some elements that we would associate with a ch typical like St. Nicholas, but I'm curious about the whole Sandman's coming. That I've not heard Sandman in reference to Christmas before. Um, and then what we have on the back is the advertisement, the leading coffee for the breakfast table, a true mixture of mocha, java, and rio. Don't forget when you go to the store to buy your groceries to ask for lion coffee and receive with every pound a beautiful Christmas card like this. Wilson Spice Company, Toledo, Ohio, and Kansas City, Missouri. And just so many different symbols. The lion coffee, they've got a shamrock for lion coffee with mocha, java, and rio on it. I would have to do research on lion coffee to know why they were using a shamrock in their advertising. Um, I'm still just, I, I don't know specifically of any Christmas traditions myself where the Sandman is involved, uh, but that, that's why I showed that one off, because it's unique and interesting and raises questions for me. Um, if I was doing some research on the history of like Christmas marketing or something like that, that might be one I want to look further into. Um, Let's see what else we have. Yeah, we can come and look at the rest of these later. I, they're a lot more really similar in that vein, uh, so I don't want to spend the entire time on them because a lot of them are really similar to each other. But I have a bunch of other things that I pulled for us to look at, which is why I'm moving on from them quite, as, quite 
quickly. The next one that I have here for you all, uh, let's see if I can get the title into the camera shot here. Uh, you get to see my handwriting, because this is one that I processed a couple of years ago. Um, processed meaning uh, we had received it and I went in and actually did the description of it and made sure that it was in a nice folder and like processed it, made sure that uh, it was housed properly in acid-free containers, etc. And then um, did the description of it. This is the is Elizabeth Wright Ingram and Gordon Ingram Christmas card designs. And Elizabeth Wright Ingram, actually, let me read to you what I have so that you know who this is and why we're interested. Um, one second while I pull up the finding aid. Anyway, while I'm doing this, if anybody wants to share, do you have particular plans for the end of the year? Do you celebrate a uh, midwinter holiday? If so, which one? And what do you enjoy about it? Um, I, would, I would love to hear. Um, all right. So, a little biographical information about Elizabeth Wright Ingram. Uh, Elizabeth Wright Ingram, fellow of the American Institute of Architects, was born in 1922 in Oak Park, Illinois and died on September 15, 2013 in San Antonio, Texas. Her father was John... Uh, her father was John Lloyd Wright, an architect and the inventor of Lincoln Log Toys and her grandfather was the noted architect Frank Lloyd Wright. She studied architecture with her grandfather at Tallison, uh, at Tallison in 1937 and with Mies van der Rohe at Armour Institute, now the Illinois Institute of Technology, before attending the University of California at Berkeley. During World War II, Elizabeth served as a draftsman for the U.S. Navy. In 1970, she found her own architecture, founded her own architecture firm, Elizabeth Wright Ingram & Associates. That same year, she also founded the Wright Ingram Institute, a nonprofit educational organization focused on the study of land use and environmental issues. Uh, Lewis Gordon Ingram, Gordon, was born on March 5, 1915 in New York, New York, and died on August 5, 1999 in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He studied architecture with Frank Lloyd Wright at Tallison in 1937 and graduated from the University of Virginia School of Architecture in 1939. During the 1940s, he volunteered with the American Field Service in North Africa and Italy. So, uh, some People with connections to Frank Lloyd Wright also, uh, apparently, you know, she's the daughter of John Lloyd Wright, who was the son of Frank Lloyd Wright, but also invented Lincoln Logs. Anyway, that's biographical. Uh, what this collection has is two Christmas cards. Like, we have a collection of two Christmas cards that they designed. Um, and so it's just illustrations from these architects of two Christmas card designs, and I thought it would be fun to share them if I can get them to show up on camera. Which could be really interesting with this because it's very, like it's yellow, um, yellow on green, yellow colored pencil on green cardboard. Uh, so that's gonna show up wonderfully on camera, right? Uh, we'll see. I'll show little bits at a time, I guess. So this is a full eight and a half by 11 sheet of construction paper here. This Taliesin, as noted, is not a pyramid. It's only a single story, <laughs> key squared. It is a very challenging color combination, especially for this camera. Um, but so you can see there's a lot of straight lines, uh, a Merry Christmas, and then 
Um, essentially, they build a tree out of candles um, with just a tiny touch of red amidst all the yellow. And this is the first one. This one is by Gordon Ingram. Uh, as you can see behind my head. Uh, let me scroll up a little bit and you can see how, where he signed the design. Gordon Ingram down here at the bottom. It's actually showing up better than I anticipated. Um, but I can, I don't think I can zoom out any further. Uh, I can zoom out a little bit. Um, <laughs> I can zoom out further. I will pick up the camera. I just want to see if I can get like the whole shot for you. So you can get an overall. It's going to wash out. It's not going to be as easy to see. Nope, that, that's just not working. It's too far away. But you can get a, a, a bit of a sense of what this illustration looks like. Uh, what I find interesting is this is not the only collection of architects drawing Christmas card illustrations that we have. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll, let's, let's look at the other one in this collection and then we'll look at another, some, some more Christmas card illustrations designed by architects or designed by an architect. So this one is the one from Elizabeth and you can see it, it appears to have been folded in the past and that has it has discolored in such a way where the fold lines are visible um, but it's very very architectural uh, and it just says at the bottom it says Merry Christmas to all and is signed by Elizabeth Gordon or Elizabeth and Gordon, I guess. So they must have done this one together. Um, but the, it's, it's a bit more abstract in its architectural design. It's got the concentric circles and what would appear, I guess, knowing that it's Christmas, I would assume that that is meant to evoke like holly or something like that. But, um, I think it's a really nice illustration. It kind of has a deco feel to it, which considering um, that they, this would have been, we don't have exact dates on this, um, but they were in school together in the 1930s. Uh, 1937 is when they attended, uh, when they studied in, at Taliesin. Um, And as far as dates on these, my best guess was 1950s, um, but definitely not after 1974. Um, but it, it definitely has an architectural feel and a bit of an art deco feel to it. And, and I just, these are two of my favorite pieces in our collections, um, partly because of the Frank Lloyd Wright collection, but partly just because I think they're really pretty, and I really enjoy the design of them. Um, I, I don't know particularly how useful they would necessarily be for research, uh, but they are quite interesting as far as uh, pieces of their own and pieces of art. Um, let me see where the other... Yes. So the other one that I have is from Han Schrader. Uh, so this is another architecture collection. Like I said, uh, another architect doing Christmas card designs. Um, And biographical information, Han Schrader was born in July of 1918 in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Um, her artistic and architectural education began early when her mother commissioned to the architect Garrett Thomas uh, Rietveld to design what is now known as the Rietveld Schrader House. Uh, 
uh, completed in 1924. Um, let's see. Did carpentry and furniture making in her teenage years. Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, Switzerland in 1936 and then graduated in 1940 with the degree in uh, a degree of uh, Diplom Architect. She did not return to the Netherlands during World War II, but worked in Portugal, where she worked for the Red Cross and the Netherlands Assem uh, Embassy and Great Britain. Uh, returned to the Netherlands in 46. 46 to 49, she worked in the Municipal Museum of Modern Art in Amsterdam under W. Sandberg. Um, Yeah, and her career continued from there. It's a very, very long uh, bio. Apparently she, in 1963, she came to the US and started work at architectural firms in LA and then moved to Garden City, New York to teach interior design. Uh, but, so what we have, this folder is labeled as typography designs for Christmas cards. Um, and so again, another architect, and we get a bunch of Christmas card designs. Uh, this is the one that I pulled for the promotional image for today's show. Um, this is what went out in the tweet. I cannot read what it says, but I will attempt to use Google Translate. Unless somebody in chat can read what it says, in which case, feel free. Met al mein live and God Wenson. With all my sweet and good wishes is what Google Translate says that that means. It says that it is in Dutch. With all my with all my love, happy Christmas. You think I. And I think that might be a more natural, uh, or not necessarily happy Christmas, but like, because uh, good wishes definitely seems more, but yeah, like with all my love and, and good wishes, seems like it would be, I have a very, very minimal study of, of uh, the Dutch language um, that I did uh, in preparation for a trip to the Netherlands a few years back in grad school. Um, so the words look somewhat familiar, but that doesn't mean I know what, what any of them mean. But I love this illustration. I love it's the black tree and the green tree and the white tree and the red tree and the blue tree and the, I just, I love it. Yeah, with all my love and good wishes. Thanks, Delora Dan. Uh, so I, I like that one. And then we have one here, uh, which appears to be a date illustration, but as like Christmas tape. But I believe it says 1969, um, but is like a, uh, a package tape dispenser. Um, let's see. Vol. Live. L I E B E. Gedachten. And good. Winston. Four. Full of sweet thoughts and good wishes for 1969. So this would be like a New Year's card. Uh, <laughs> and they're signed Van Key. Um, so I don't know. They're part of the Han Schrader collection, but possibly done by someone else. Um, but I think that's a really unique and interesting design. Uh, it's, it's definitely like kind of the card that you would send best wishes for a happy new year 19 or best wishes for 
happy 2022. Uh, this was essentially that, but for 1969. And this one just literally translates to have a good one. Uh, <laughs> Habin er good. Um, and uh, like designed on the back of a, like a worksheet or something. Hi, Alura, thank you. Thank you so much for the tier one subscription and welcome back for eight months. So this would appear to be a very architectural 150. Um, if you can't see it, there's there's the blue line here is the one, and then uh, the five traces there, and then this would be the zero. A happy, happy year. 150, I don't know exactly, maybe they're, maybe it's incomplete, maybe, because I definitely don't see a full year here, unless you could interpret the five as also a nine, so maybe 1950? I don't, I don't know. That, that's the, the flat out, like, I'm not certain. But it is an interesting design. I'm gonna zoom in closer. We will be remodeling the space and getting some new technology and stuff fairly soon-ish. Uh, and so hopefully we'll get um, lighting that works a little bit better for showing off the documents and the writing on them. Because uh, right now the lighting is the challenge that's washing out some of the thinner lines. Um, and I know that's an issue. <laughs> All right, let's see what else we got. What else we got? Uh, good for two old I'm not 100% certain exactly what this will translate to. Uh, the <clears throat> Google Translate basically says, good for you and the world, uh, which I'm guessing is some sort of like best wishes type sentiment. Um, and I think, again, this is a New Year's card. I believe we have 1979. but just very architectural illustration, which considering they're an architect, I guess makes sense. Uh, this one's just got a six on it. And the sentiment here is something along the lines of uh, With some extra love and good uh, and and warm wishes for the new year. Um, I, it's not a literal translation. That's the, the gist of it from just looking at it. This is another New Year's card. Let me zoom out and see how much of that I can get into the shot. So, just 
interesting designs on them, I think. Just that 1979 card again. This one is in English and says best wishes for the holidays. Uh, I am not going to translate everything that's on here because, like I said, I don't speak Dutch. I don't read Dutch. And that's a lot of Dutch. I could figure it out, but it would take more time than we really want to spend on it. Um, this is another, like, the illustration here is, again, a year. And I'm not certain. 19... Possibly, like, 80-something, but I'm not certain. I think it's 1983. So you've got the little, the eight here, and then the three is the big green outline there, but I'm not certain. And here we get... Peace, wish faith in future, 2000. So just some interesting illustrations here. Yeah, Fluden, I. I just saw your note, and, and yeah, I thought it looked like 83. Um, so those are the illustrations that were in here. I think they're quite interesting. Um, so when I was looking for things for the, today's program, I came across in our local vertical files. So vertical files, I've, I've explained before on stream, um, vertical files are newspaper clippings, ephemera, other things where we just gather them together in a topical file. Um, and we keep vertical files on university history topics, uh, local history topics for like the, um, the county and uh, the city and things like that, um, as well as some on specific people, uh, etc. So this is from our Montgomery County, uh, Virginia vertical files, and this folder is just labeled Christmas Store. Um, I have never looked in this folder, I don't know what's in it, but we're going to open it up and take a look today and see what's in our vertical file on the Montgomery County Christmas Store, which is not a, not a shop that I am familiar with. Um, all right, so newspapers, what we were expecting, of course, it is a vertical file, so we were expecting newspapers. Uh, setup is scheduled for Sunday at Enterprise Building on Roanoke Street in Christiansburg. Christiansburg is the county seat for Montgomery County. Um, volunteers at the Montgomery County Christmas Store got busy unpacking this week. Plans to locate the store in the old Kroger Building were recently changed because of unexpected delays in setup at that location. Kroger, if you're not familiar, is a large grocery store chain in kind of the southeastern United, St United States. Um, uh, now the store is back where it was last year, in the Enterprise Building at 755 Roanoke Street. During unloading on Saturday, volunteers retrieved new goods from storage facilities all over the country, as well as tractor trailers and security lots, and moved them into the Enterprise Building. We had approximately 60 volunteers, says co-chair Patsy Dillon Long, and we thought that was a great turnout in light of the last minute changes in dates. Moving to the Enterprise Building delayed the volunteers a bit, but they are well on their way. Setup is this Sunday from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. That's when shelving will be assembled to hold the merchandise. The store now holds all of the new goods that were in the store from last year. The new goods department include clothing, toys, teen gifts, and household items. Uh, this is from 2000. Accepting donations of new and used goods during the next few weeks, volunteers 
ask that the used goods be gently used, toys, clothing, and functional household items. I'm still not clear on, I, I mean, it, it sounds like a store. Uh, is there something special about it? Why, does, why do we have a vertical file on the Christmas store? I think this one might answer our question. This is an article from 1999, uh, December 11th of 1999. Oh, yeah, uh, so the paper clips, these are actually called Plastic Clips, which is actually a brand name. Um, and so, yes, we are using paper clips to hold things together. These are not the perfect solution. The perfect solution would be to not bend the paper at all, but these are an improvement over uh, like standard steel paper clips, um, like the paper clips that. Uh, made the fortune of the family featured in Thoroughly Modern Millie, uh, but <laughs> the ones that rest over time. Uh, so kind of the hierarchy of archival purposes and paper clips would be, uh, you've got your standard paper clips, like the metal ones. Those are the worst, because they will rust and damage the materials over time. Next would be the plastic coated metal paper clips. Um, they still have a little metal tip that sticks out that's going to rust and is going to damage your materials over time, but it's going to be much less damage than the all metal paper clips. Um, and then we have these, they're just plastic uh, formed into a clip. Um, so these, these plastic clips um, are kind of like the best solution that we have if a paper clip needs to be used. Um, and of course next would be having an individual folder for each item that needed to be collated together which just is cost prohibitive and um, just not a realistic solution. So paper clips exist for a reason. They are quite useful. <clears throat> and so part of processing a collection oftentimes is just Remove the, pla remove the metal ones, replace with plastic ones. <clears throat> um, yeah. Store sounds like a place where underprivileged families can go shop for Christmas presents. Uh, no, I, Puddle Glum, I think you're right, and I think that that's what this article is going to tell us. Um, so this is from 1999. More than 1,000 volunteers have given their time to help at the Montgomery County Christmas store since it opened on Wednesday. Catherine Bresky is one of those volunteers. Bresky has volunteered with the store since its inception in 1982, serving in different positions on various committees. This year, however, Bresky is a hostess. Bresky said that she didn't have as much time to be involved with the store as she had in the past, so she decided to serve as hostess. You don't want to give this up, volunteering for the store, even if you don't have time, Bresky said while assisting a family through, that, through the store. To shop at the store, an individual must go through an application process and meet certain criteria. They must be a full-time Montgomery County resident, and be classified at no more than 125% of the federal poverty guidelines, with the poverty level being defined at 100%. In addition, the individual must, be, must also be disabled, a senior citizen, or have children. For the first time, the Christmas store teamed up with the Salvation Army to conduct eligibility screenings. In the past, those who wanted to shop at the store applied through the mail, but this year, individuals were sent notices through the mail informing them of dates when applications would be accepted in person. If applicants did not qualify to shop at the store, they were given the opportunity to apply for assistance from the Salvation Army and get placed on an, on an angel tree. Applicants could not qualify for both the Christmas store and Salvation Army assistance, but could be placed on the angel tree regardless of what they qualified for. When the store opened in 1982, 207 families were 
served as of Friday, 1,060 shoppers were eligible to shop at the store this year and applications were still being accepted. Saturday, December 11th, will be the last day to shop at the store. In addition, the Christmas store has raised $95,000 towards its $160,000 goal. When an eligible indivi individual or family comes to the store to shop, they are assigned a host or hostess to accompany them through the store, which is set up to resemble a department store with signs identifying the different sections. All of the items in the store are tagged with a point value. Each shopper is allotted a certain amount of points for each department they are eligible to shop in. In addition, if the shopper has volunteered with the store, they are awarded 30 extra points that can be spent in any department. The host or hostess helps the shoppers find the items they are looking for in the store and helps keep, helps tr keep track of, or and keeps track of points for them. We just want to make everybody happy. That's our goal, Bresky said to a teenage, uh, to a teenage girl as she helps her pick an item in the teen gifts section of the store. The 16-year-old is shopping at the store with her grandparents, all of whom are being escorted by Bresky. Bresky and the family left the teen gifts section and made their way to the department for seniors where the young woman's grandparents got to spend some of their points. The group then traveled to the housewares department, but not before picking up a box of various food items on the way. As Bresky and the family left each department, the volunteers who are serving in that particular section wish them all a Merry Christmas. Between the hectic moments of maneuvering through the crowded store, Bresky commented that all of the planning that has gone into in, to setting up the store commented on all the planning. It makes it easy to volunteer, she says, adding that volunteers receive a quick training session and are then ready to help the shoppers. It's very well thought out to make the volunteers feel comfortable. It certainly did take a great deal of planning for this year's store. After being located in the same spot for the past eight years, volunteers were forced to look for a new home for the store. In June, Montgomery County offered the Christmas store space in the Enterprise Development Center, which is located on Roanoke Street in Christiansburg. Uh, that was when the plans really began. Yeah, I'm, there's like two more paragraphs, but I'm, I'm going to end it there. So yeah, it is a, a shopping store reserved for people who are um, poor. Uh, they have to prove they're poor and then they get to shop there uh, so that they can have uh, as normal a Christmas as possible, uh, according to societal standards. Um, interesting. I did not know that that was a thing here. Uh, the statistics there, like, that was definitely meant as a feel-good story, but reading it, I was like, what I read was we went from 200 families that were at the poverty level in Montgomery County in 1986 when they set up the store to a thousand a couple of decades later. Um, I'm uncertain that those are the actual numbers, but that's how it came across to me as I was reading it. And so it was less of a feel-good story for me than uh, an economic one. But, uh, all right. Next, I have a folder here from the Melvin Feldenheimer collection. And I know nothing about this collection, so I'm gonna look up Melvin Feldenheimer and see why we have this collection, and then we'll look for the holiday thing. Melvin Feldenheimer graduated from the Virginia Polytechnic Institute in 1944. While attending VPI, he was the band leader of the Southern Colonels. The band became very popular following World War II, and they toured the South under the name Mel Felton and the Southern Colonels. Uh, in 1946, the band was featured on the radio station WCSC in South Carolina. A copy of this broadcast is included with the collection. Um, yeah, and indeed, we have the uh, we have the cassette tape here. <laughs> The poverty line is low. 125% of that is still not great. Indeed, Puddle Glum. Uh, but let's see what we have here. I, I think it's going to be something Virginia Tech related. Um, ring dance, German club, freshman banquet, ring dance, holiday card. So 
So we have a Virginia Tech Christmas card in this collection. You can see it's got the little, um, the rough edge there, which is intentional. Uh, this, it, the, the picture is titled The Colors, uh, which is uh, terminology referring to the flags. Um, and you've got four members of the Virginia Tech Corps of Cadets, uh, two of them carrying the flags. Um, it does not say who the artist is, Philip. Uh, I also don't see a signature on the artwork itself. So it just says the colors, Virginia Polytechnic Institute. Um, but the, and, and honestly, that's not unusual. Um, art done, art is done by the like marketing teams or on behalf of Virginia Tech quite often. And the artists themselves often don't get to sign the work. It's just done for the institution. Um, But it is a lovely illustration there, a lovely, uh, and that entryway that like, um, it's not an entryway, it's a, like a tunnel through a building, um, like a breezeway. Uh, and it looks like it's probably one of the Eggleston buildings, uh, just based on the architecture. Um, there are some other buildings that it could be, but uh, my guess would be that that's an illustration of um, like East Eggleston Hall or uh, one of the buildings on the Eggleston Quad. Um, and there's nothing actually inside here other than it, it does say Virginia Polytechnic Institute, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, um, but there's not like a personal message or anything like that. Uh, there's a post-it note on the back that says 1940 Christmas card. Uh, so this is the Christmas card from 1940 here at Virginia Tech. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure, Philip. Uh, it's possible that it was done for another purpose and then just used for the card. Um, it is definitely a snow scene and an illustration, uh, rather than a photograph, but, um... Yeah, I don't, I don't really know anything about it. There's no information with it. All I knew was that it was a, that there was a Christmas card in this collection. And so I wanted to share it and show it. Because it's the only Virginia Tech Christmas related item that I was able to locate. Uh, let's see. I don't think, yeah, there's, that's the only item in this collection that is Christmas related or holiday related. So we'll move on from Melvin Feldenheimer. Um, skip this one. So I wanna look at, we have, some cookbooks, of course, that are specifically holiday cookbooks. Uh, and this one is just called The Holidays Cookbook by Virginia and Robert Hoffman. And the reason that I pull this one first is this is the only thing that I was able to pull for today that includes Hanukkah. Uh, there were some president's papers that referenced in their correspondence uh, a topic heading of Jewish holidays. Um, I did not manage to get them pulled out of storage in time for today, so it's possible that they might have mentioned Hanukkah in there, but I don't know uh, because I didn't, it, like, the only information I have is Jewish holidays. Um, but here is what this book has on Hanukkah, a traditional Hanukkah celebration for eight. Borscht, coleslaw, simis, uh, potato latkes, 
applesauce, sour cream, sweet potatoes, carrots, apple strudel, a bowl of nuts, chocolate coins, a bowl of fruit, coffee, and tea. And then they suggest, with the main course, an off-dry Riesling or a uh, Grignolio, a Gr Grignolino? I don't know this type of wine. Uh, if a dry or red is desired, try a light Merlot. With the strudel, an apple or pear brandy will complement the fruit. And then in the following pages are recipes for each of those items mentioned. So the one that most people are going to associate with Hanukkah, most non-Jewish people especially, are going to associate potato latkes with Hanukkah. So I thought we would look at the potato latkes recipe. Uh, two pounds of potatoes, one pound of parsnips, two green onions chopped, one quarter cup of flour, salt and pepper to taste, two large eggs beaten, four tablespoons of vegetable oil. Peel and finely shred the potatoes and parsnips. Squeeze as much water from them as is possible. Add green onions, flour, salt, pepper, and eggs to mixture. Combine thoroughly. Heat oil in a skillet over medium heat. Drop a quarter cup of the mixture into the skillet and flatten to three to four inches in diameter. Brown on each side about five minutes and place on a wire rack. And then repeat. So there you have uh, potato latkes or potato pancakes um, that you can use for your Hanukkah celebration next year since Hanukkah is already passed for this year. Uh, but I didn't want to completely ignore all of the other midwinter holidays just because our collections really don't have anything to represent them. Uh, That said, I'm not going to spend lots of time because, like I said, we don't have a lot of content there. Um, it is something that I would very much love to add is more stuff, especially about Kwanzaa or, um, heck, even Festivus, uh, Yule as, as a celebration distinct from Christmas. Um, and Eid would be a good holiday to add things. Sometimes it falls around Christmas time, um, so it becomes a midwinter holiday, although it, it travels around the calendar quite a lot more than others. Um, anyway, <laughs> as I ramble on about uh, non-Christian holidays, um, here I have a, a lovely little book called Oh man, it's not called Oh Man. I'm just, I laid it down and then suddenly it washed out completely. Called A Baker's Dozen Christmas Recipes. Uh-oh. What's going on? That was really, really, really strange. Uh, it was just very strange. My computer was like, hey, I just decided I'm going to close your browser and you're going to lose all your captions and everything. Um, it didn't actually close it because my browser was like, do you really want to close? But anyway, a baker's dozen Christmas recipes. Uh, this, let's see, comprising 13 appropriate recipes for the Christmas season. Philadelphia, George W. Jacobs and Company, Publishers. Uh, copyright 1911 by George W. Jacobs and Company. So the first one is something we hear about a lot at Christmas time, but a lot of Americans definitely don't know what a plum pudding actually is. Um, so definitely something that I want to look at. I want to learn what is a plum pudding. Because in American English, 
plum pudding brings to mind a flavored milk custard, uh, like a milk custard that is flavored with plums. That is what the words plum pudding brings to mind in American English. That is not what a plum pudding is, but plum pudding in this context is British English, which pudding generally in British English as I understand it, and feel free to correct me if I get this wrong, pudding refers to uh, what we in America call dessert. So a pudding can be cake, a pudding can be custard, a uh, pudding is sort of like the sweet finisher to a meal uh, that we would refer to as dessert in America. Um, and like I said, if I've gotten that incorrect, do let me know. But I am going to read this description for English Plum Pudding and we will see exactly what <clears throat> this cookbook from 1911 says Plum Pudding is. Um, in parentheses under the title, it says prize awarded by the queen. One pound of raisins, a quarter pound of flour, one pound suet chopped fine, one pound of currants, a three quarters pound of stale bread crumbs, one quarter nutmeg of, uh, one quarter nutmeg grated, one pound brown sugar, five eggs, grated rind of one lemon, half a pint of brandy, half a pound of minced candied orange peel, Clean, wash, and dry the currants. Stone the raisins, mix all dry ingredients together. Beat the eggs, add them to the brandy. Then pour over the dry ingredients and mix thoroughly. Pack in greased small molds and boil six hours. Serve with hard brandy sauce. This will make six pounds. So, based on this description, a uh, English plum pudding is a boiled cake that is specifically a fruit cake. It's similar to a bread pudding. Um, this, so it, in actuality, plum pudding is a fruit cake, what we would think of as a fruit cake. Um, specifically a boiled cake, so you make the dough, you mix everything together, it's got the dried raisins and the currants and the, uh, um, this one doesn't include nuts, but often fruitcake also includes nuts. Uh, it's got the brandy. So alcohol, dried fruits, these are the hallmarks of a fruitcake. And in this, in this case, you actually get the dough together um, and you boil it. So basically you pack it uh, into some sort of container and, and boil it and rather than baking it. So you get a really moist, dense uh, cake that's full of spices and, and rum flavors and um, preserved fruits. And that is an English plum pudding. <laughs> Hi, Urban Bohemian, how are you today? <laughs> uh, yeah, a boiled cake with the raisins and currants. It, no, it doesn't seem like it would be bad at all. I've just, I've never actually had a plum pudding. I've made gingerbread though that is very similar to this. Um, and, and the shape, so this cookbook, A Baker's Dozen Christmas Recipes, uh, this is the shape of an English plum pudding. Like that is what this book is meant to look like, is an English plum pudding. So we follow that up with cheap fruit cake, a cup full of dark molasses, a half a cup full of brown sugar, a half a cup full of butter, a cup full of hot water, one dessert spoonful of soda, two cupfuls of flour, one dessert spoonful of spices, and add currants, citron, and raisins to your liking. Bake in a quick oven. Um, I'm not the expert on our food collections. Uh, I'm not sure if Kira has arrived in the chat yet. Um, I believe a dessert spoonful would be roughly equivalent to, or, or similar to like what we expect a teaspoon to be today. Um. <laughs> Herb, 
I'm sorry if you feel insulted by the book. Uh, I don't think cheap fruitcake was intended for you. Um, <laughs> but we follow that with a mince pie. Um, and what I find really interesting here is the mince pie here is not a typical mince pie. Um, usually mince, mince pies include suet. This one's including actually, actual like chopped beef. Um, two pounds of lean beef chopped fine, two pounds of suet chopped fine, two and a half pounds of stoned raisins, uh, stoned meaning that the seeds have been removed, um, two and a half pounds of cleaned currants, one and a half pounds of sliced citron, uh, one and a half pounds of light brown sugar, one tablespoonful each of powdered cloves, mace, cinnamon, and allspice, Season to taste, one and a half pints of brandy. Uh, when making the pies, to every four tablespoonfuls of minced meat, add one of chopped apple. Um, so it sounds like it would be an absolutely lovely pie. We tend not to think of sweet or spiced pies as including meat today, but a mincemeat pie, which today typically does not include any meat and might just have a hint of suet in it, like if you go to the grocery store and buy Nunsuch, uh, it has beef suet, but basically just enough so they can include that on the ingredients list. Um, because in our society today in America, we don't expect meat in sweet pies, but there's no reason it can't be there. <laughs> uh, it doesn't seem too big to me. Puddle glum. Uh, that seems. Those proportions seem about right for making a pie. Let's see, we have stuffed goose, stuffed goose, French turkey soup, almond macaroons, Hungarian stuffed goose neck, and then we get a full-on fruit cake. So we had the cheap fruit cake earlier, and now we get a fruit cake. Yeah, yeah, Philip. Um, beef suet does not have a meaty taste. Beef suet is more like lard. So the fact that that actually included beef or l lamb in addition to beef suet um, is a little unusual. I've never seen one that has meat in it, but there's no reason that meat can't go into a sweet pie like that. The main problem is that meat, reading about meat pies first makes you hungry and then gets Mrs. Lovett's song stuck in your head, which is an awkward combination. Um, indeed, Key Squared, that would be an awkward combination, although I have made many a mincemeat pie while wearing my Mrs. Lovett's Meat Pies apron, uh, <laughs> and I've made, I've made mincemeat a few times while wearing my Mrs. Lovett's apron. Um, <laughs> the worst pies in London, indeed. Uh, there will be singing, but later. Uh, so the actual, like, the not cheap fruitcake, the fruitcake fruitcake. Take one pound of brown sugar, two cupfuls of molasses, six eggs, and one heaping cupful of butter. Stir these together, then add gradually one ounce of seeded and chopped raisins, three pounds of cleaned currants, a half a pound of citron shaved thin, one pound of dates stoned and chopped fine, two and a half teaspoonfuls of baking powder, and flour enough to make a stiff batter, and then bake in a slow oven. The cheap one wanted a fast oven, or a quick oven. German stuffed turkey, turkey fritters with oranges, turkey and orange salad. So we, we tend to associate turkey more with Thanksgiving today, but turkey was very much a Christmas, uh, a Christmas bird. Um, back at the beginning of the 1900s. Uh, English tarts, boiled turkey with oyster sauce, and that is all of the recipes in there. Let's see what else we have today. Because we're 45 minutes away from the end and uh, I have quite a bit more to look at. Um, isn't that always the case with this stream? It's like, where does the time go? Ah, uh, let's see. 
how I can position this one for best viewing. I think it might just be flat like that. Uh, the 15th thousand. I don't know exactly. 15th thousand. The American Ladies Cookery Book comprising every variety of information for ordinary and holiday occasions by Mrs. T.J. Crowen, author of Every Lady's Book, of which over 200,000 copies have been sold. New York, Thomas J. Crowen, 699 Broadway, 1861. <laughs> Where does the time go is a question that you ask with a lot of streams. Uh, yeah. So this is a, um, a cookbook from the early 18, or from, yeah, 1861 in the United States. Uh, I believe it had a holiday section, which is why I chose it. Uh... Ooh, an arrangement of table and bills of fare for tea, summer or winter, dinner, ceremonious family dinners, holiday dinners, Christmas dinners. So holiday dinners and Christmas dinners are different things here, um, but they're all located on page 404. So let us see what this book from 1861 has to say about holiday dinners and Christmas dinners. Zoom in a little bit here. And if you're wondering at all about the music that we are listening to today, this is just uh, the Pretzel Rocks holiday music station um, with lyrics turned off and YouTube safe turned on. <laughs> so that is what we're listening to today. Um, holiday dinners. Great attention should be paid to the arrangement of the table, which should abound in appropriate ornaments such as evergreens for Christmas and New Year, national uh, emblematic devices for Fourth of July, etc. Roast turkey and mince pies for Christmas and New Year are, are with us. <clears throat> oh, sorry, that sentence took a second for me to parse. Roast turkey and mince pies for Christmas and New Year are with us what roast beef and plum pudding are to the English. To arrange a Christmas dinner, place a high pyramid of evergreens made as before directed in the center of the table. I wonder where that was before directed. Uh, light, let a roasted turkey of uncommon Size. Occupy the middle or center of one side of the table. On one end, let there be a cold boiled ham, and at the other, fricasseed chicken or a roast pig. With the turkey, serve mashed potatoes and turnips, boiled onions, and dressed celery or other salad with applesauce. Near the ham, place fried or mashed potatoes and pickles or mangoes. And with the pig or fricassee, the same as with the turkey. Large pitchers of sweet cider, or where that is not desired, ice water, should be placed diagonally opposite each other on two corners of the table. Boiled turkey with oyster sauce may occupy the place of the fricassee or instead a fine oyster pie. For dessert, there should be one or two very large and ornamental mince pies. One sufficiently large that each of the company may be helped from it in token of common interest er, is desired. Uh, ice creams and jellies and jams and ripe fruits and nuts with sweet cider and syrup water of different sorts or wines complete the dessert. Biscuit and jelly sandwich may be served at dessert or paste puffs and charlotte de russe or uh, blancmange with stands of jelly. I'm not certain what Charlotte de Russe or Blancmange are. I might have to look those up. I've never had mashed turnips, P-squared. 
Yes, a turkey of uncommon size. So, meaning a large turkey. <laughs> In the usual manner, as previously directed, yes. Uh, I'm like, great, thanks for telling me that. Now I have to dig back through 403 other pages to see where you told me that. <laughs> but these were meant to be like the lady's Bible of how to run the household. Um, it, this one is more focused on cooking, but usually they, they are very much like, this is how you run a house. Um, all right, let me look up these words because I don't know these words. Uh, Charlotte de Russe. Oh. Uh, basically, it is a raspberry pie, like a raspberry gelatin pie. Um, or it's a cake. Lady fingers, Bavarian cream. And fruit, so gen like strawberries. It's a no bake dessert from the eighteen late nineteenth century, and let's see, blanc mange, white mouth. Um, blanc mange is a sweet dessert popular throughout Europe, commonly made with milk or cream or and sugar. Thickened with rice flour, gelatin, corn starch. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, uh, or Irish moss. And often flavored with almonds. <laughs> Puddle glam and key squared. Uh, that's awesome. I love the Princess, Bar Princess Bride reference. Um, <clears throat> so that is a peek at what you should serve at Christmas, uh, according to a ladies' cookbook from the late 19th century. Let's see what else we have here. The very best Hallmark recipes. Uh, I'm gonna have to zoom out, the book is too big. Also, remember to throw my eye to the time occasionally so I don't lose time and we get a chance to look at the Wonder Broads, um, <laughs> which is not going to be what you expect from that name. Uh, 1994, Hallmark Cards Incorporated. So we have a large, uh, like, cooking collection here. I'm just gonna flip through and find something particularly interesting that I can read about. I'm surprised pepperoni bread from Wisconsin. I would expect that from Pennsylvania. Hi Hannah! Welcome! I'm so glad that you're here. I hope that you're doing okay. See Forgotten Souffle, Christmas Quiche. All right, I'm gonna turn the page one more time and then we're gonna read whatever's there. Well, as long as it's a recipe. <laughs> Let's see, we've looked at fruitcakes a couple times. Sorry, I said we would read it. Ooh, German Christmas cake. Let's read that one. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, Hannah. And hopefully we can continue to make it a better day than you expected. Uh, German Christmas cake. This is from Virginia R. Sattler in Jamestown, North Dakota. Uh, we have a very long list of ingredients here. Butter, sugar, eggs, mashed potatoes, flour, cocoa, baking powder, cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, milk, pecans, 
red candied cherries, flaked coconut, food coloring, uh, and then a glaze. I'm really curious, the mashed potatoes. Beat butter until fluffy, beat in the sugar, beat in egg yolks, add mashed potatoes. Beating on medium speed, 30 seconds. Mix in the flour, the cocoa, the baking powder, and spices, alternately with milk. Beat egg whites to stiff but not dry peaks in a large bowl. Fold in the egg whites into the batter. Fold in the pecans and one cup of cherry. Pour the batter into a angel food cake pan. And then bake. And then you glaze it. And then you add coconut. Apparently, you're supposed to use food coloring to dye the coconut first. Interesting. So it's just a cake. The potatoes are just part of the mixture for the cake. I suppose the starch that's in them helps somehow. I, it's not the first time I've seen savory ingredients like that. Um, mixed into various cake recipes. There are a lot of Depression era recipes that use unusual ingredients that we would not typically associate uh, in order to make cakes happen. Um, there are some actually really good streams out there or, or uh, programs out there. I've mentioned before on YouTube um, the Depression era playlist from uh, Emmy Made um, on YouTube definitely worth a watch if you want to see some of those things where there's unusual ingredients that go into a cake that turn out just fine. Um, so yeah, if you're at all interested in, in some more unique recipes and seeing them tried, uh, I definitely recommend Emmy Made. It's E-M-M-Y-M-A-D-E. And if you search for her um, on YouTube, you should find her fairly easily. Uh, All right, I think we'll do one more cookbook and then I'm gonna look at, actually, no, we're not gonna do another cookbook. We're gonna do some Pillsbury ephemera and then the Wonder Broads. So ephemera, we have uh, items here from a collection, the Lynn Oliver collection. And we've looked at some culinary ephemera before. Oh, was not worth it. Thank you for being here. I hope that you have enjoyed it and that I will see you again soon. Um, so these are like advertising type materials, brochures, things like that from, um, from culinary companies, particularly because it's a culinary ephemera collection. Uh, apparently I am zoomed out as far as the camera will go. So these two folders that I have right now happen to be Pillsbury, and I know there are some holiday themed uh, books in this one. Best Loved Foods of Christmas. Um, so because this is a collection we've never looked at before, I am gonna go ahead and pull up some information so that we know who Lynn Oliver was and potentially why she had all of these uh, or he actually I don't know uh, they why they had all of these because Lynn spelled L-Y-N-N-E doesn't imply a gender <laughs> old cookbooks have some gems in them you use several recipes from the good housekeeping cookbook from the 50s I grew up using the Good Housekeeping and the Betty Crocker cookbooks from the 50s, and they are really good. Um, all right, there's gotta be, oh, sorry. <laughs> I think I touched the microphone there. Um, do we not have a biographical note? The, Lynn Oliver materials we received relatively recently and we're still actually processing a lot of the stuff 
Um, this collection contains pamphlets separated from the Lynn Oliver cookbook collection, as well as some email correspondence related to scholarship by Oliver and three personal objects found in the boxes of donated books. The pamphlets make up the majority of the collection, represent several hundred different companies, and date from about the 1890s to the early 2000s. Correspondence was written during the 2000s and early 2010s. But we do not have a biographical note about Lynn Oliver, so I don't know anything about them or why they had collected all of these cookbooks and brochures. If I learn, I will gladly share in the future, but I don't know that information today. Best love foods of Christmas for the most wonderful time of all when only the best will do. <clears throat> Best of the Bake Offs, 65 recipes for America's hospital, hospitable holiday season featuring the 10 best butter cookies. And this was 25 cents. <clears throat> I don't have a date. I don't see a date as to when this was put out by Pillsbury. Which is honestly not unusual. A lot of times pamphlets or brochures or these company publications don't include the normal publication information that we get on books that tells us when they were done, uh, which is frustrating uh, for historical research and archives purposes and things like that because uh, so many times things are not dated and we don't know. Uh, there is a clue Tucked in here on page 10, between pages 10 and 11, is a grocer's coupon <clears throat> for contact lenses. Uh, from 2008, which just lets us know that this cookbook was actively in use in 2008. That's all it tells us. It doesn't tell us when it was published, just that it was actively in use in 2008. <clears throat> so, I'm going to read one recipe from this book, because Wonder Broads will take a little bit of time and is going to be enjoyable. Let's see, Stalin. Uh, Christmas tree loaves. Let's do Christmas tree loaves and Norwegian holiday bread. We'll do both of these and then we'll move on. Christmas tree loaves. Klipta uh, Kransar from Pillsbury's European recipe service, a bread from Sweden. If you had to guess from style, you'd guess this is either late 1940s or early 50s. Um, honestly, I would be with you. The illustrations say to me like 60s, 70s, just based on some of the programming we did over the summer where we went through like the history of American Backyard Grilling and saw uh, cookbooks from the 1890s through today. Um, I, I would agree just based on the photography in here that this is probably 60s, 70s time frame. Uh, I would go more 60s than, than 70s, but definitely post-World War II. Uh, I haven't, there's no like illustrations of individual people. And it, it could be anywhere between like the 40s and the, and the 60s, I would say. Uh, all right, so bake at 350 for 20, 20 to 25 minutes and it makes three Christmas trees. One packet of active dry yeast or one cake compressed yeast in one quarter cup of warm water, a uh, half a cup of butter in one and a half cups of hot scalded milk in a large bowl, cool to lukewarm, half a cup of sugar, 
uh, two unbeaten eggs, two teaspoons of salt, and one quarter teaspoon of French cardamom, if desired, and softened yeast. And one thing that I'm doing here that I do when I look at these books in real life when they're written this way is I'm looking at this as an, a list of ingredients because I'm so used to having a list of ingredients followed by the instructions, but this is both. Soften the dry yeast in warm water. Melt the butter. Stir in the sugar, eggs, salt, and French cardamom. So it's a list of ingredients that you can go down to make sure you have the ingredients, but it's also the instructions at the same time. And this layout confuses me because I'm not used to seeing it. Um, but it's actually a really good layout. Uh, add flour, knead, let it rise, combine the sugar, or combine sugar with nuts and cinnamon, melt butter, divide the dough into three parts, uh, roll up triangle. Ah. We were supposed to shape with a hands and a rolling pin into triangle shapes, apparently. Roll up the triangle, starting with one of the bottom corners and rolling along the base to form a triangle-shaped roll. Place on greased baking sheet, flatten triangle, cut deep gashes at three-quarters inch intervals down each side, almost to center. Let it rise again and then bake it. And, and you get the illustration, so you kind of get a sense of what it would look like. It looks like a filled bread. The Norwegian holiday bread uh, is kind of like a fruit cake, a glazed fruit cake. Um, I just thought I would share that illustration because it's a lovely color illustration. Then it includes a recipe developed by Anne Pillsbury. Uh, butter and milk, adding in yeast, adding sugar, salt, raisins, candied cherries, a slightly beaten egg, and flour. Let it rise. And then you do the baking. Fairly simple, like, cake recipe, but um, honestly, I could spend an entire stream looking at these because uh, the, just the pamphlets themselves are just amazing and interesting pieces of history. I won't do that today because today we have other plans and I was doing more of a survey of holiday items than a focus on uh, advertising materials. To keep saying I'm gonna do again, I've done some advertising materials in the past, but okay. Uh, let's see. I think it's time for Wonder Broads. I keep mentioning the Wonder Broads. You all don't know anything about them. <laughs> but food! So, let me pull up the description here. <clears throat> so the materials we're gonna look at next are from the Melinda E. Pittman Theatrical Collection, uh, spanning 1974 to 2012, but most of it's from the period of like 1990 to 2008. <clears throat> Melinda E. Pittman was born in 1953 in Falls Church, Virginia. She graduated from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University Theater Arts Department in 1975 with a Bachelor of Arts in Honors and uh, in uh, Bachelor of Arts in Theater <laughs> with an uh, uh, bleh, bleh. Wow, I wrote that and that sentence makes no sense. I'm going to have to go back and fix that. Uh, she then spent a year studying theater directing at Tulane. Um, before moving to Portland, Oregon. In Portland, Pittman worked with various theatrical companies, including the Portland Labor Players, the Fallen Angel Choir, and Broad Arts Theater. She received the 2000 Angus L. Bomer Drama Award from the Oregon Book Awards for her show Wonder Broads, The Babes and Broads Who Broke the Rules, highlighting the contributions of women throughout history. 
In 2013, she received a Master of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies focusing on women's social justice theater from Merrillhurst University in Merrillhurst, Oregon. Uh, so her, this collection includes various items from her work, particularly in Portland, and um, a lot of the shows that they did were annual Christmas shows. So this, uh, the materials I'm going to share are uh, particularly from the Fallen Angel Choir. Um, here I have. Uh, we're just going to be able to look at it because I don't have a record player with me. Uh, but the Fallen Angel Choir, Christmas Rap, Clanging Bells. This is a 45, uh, which is a record. It is still sealed. I'm not going to open it. Is the other one open? Nope. I could open one of them. I don't have to, though. But uh, so the Fallen Angel Choir... Christmas rap, clanging bells, robust and satirical Christmas carols. Um, and we, we have more than just 45s that we get to look at. Uh, but as you can see, we've got a lovely record here. We have drafts of various versions of their satirical lyrics. Uh, so we're going to look at those, and I will do my best to try and remember the tunes, and uh, maybe we will sing a few bars. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, if you are at all interested, um, the Wonder Broads uh, and Fallen Angel Choir stuff it should be available on Spotify and Apple Music, etc. If you happen to want to listen to any of the Wonder Broads stuff, um, they definitely have some material that's out there on modern music platforms or available for purchase. Um, let's see what we have. So the first folder here is a thick boy. Um, this is Angel Time Productions Incorporated, Angels, The Next Generation, uh, which kind of dates this. Um, it's, it's undated, but The Next Generation. This was definitely from like the early 90s time when like Star Trek The Next Generation was new. Um, I, I, just from having worked with Melinda and my understanding of what they were going for, Plus some of the lyrics, you can kind of figure that out. Uh, Frank and Sensitive Comedy Christmas Carols. So, Angels, The Next Generation. Let's see what we have in store in this comedic spoofiness. Um, A message from the captain. Thank you for coming to this evening's show and for sharing some of your time, energy, and enjoyment of puns and parodies with this next generation of angels. We are delighted to rel we are delighted you relish this goofy work that the angels do. Remember, when relishing, always use condiments. As you know, I've been an angel for 12 years now, performing year-round in new shows every six months, creating this progressive, political, feminist topical comedy music stuff has become the passion that drives my heart. Thank you for laughing at my passion. Have a wonderful, connected, and chuckle-filled Christmas and Hanukkah. Melinda E. Pittman, Artistic Director, Angel Time Productions Incorporated. Um, so this is a, essentially a, a show playbill. Uh, and this is like before Patreon you had theatrical donors. <laughs> that got thanked in the programs. Uh, let's see. So we have some notes here. Writing notes. October of 97. Act 1. First jokes. 
Good evening, and welcome to the first performance of the first year of Angels the Next Generation. Wow, I can't believe how fast things change. Time flies when you're an aging baby boomer. In my day, only Santa and your mom had a laptop. Yeah, I came of age during the me decade, when social responsibility meant RSVPing for the Donald's prenup party. Wow, that, that joke did not age well. Um, I grew up in the 80s. In my day, fertility drugs were pina coladas and Jimmy Buffett. And birth control was the back seat of my, my dad's Chevette. In my day, Greenspan was a park and Everclear was acne medication. Wow. Uh, so yeah, there's some, some jokes in here that don't necessarily hold up as, today, but I think you get the gist of kind of where they're going. So that, that's the beginning of one of their shows. <laughs> the program had an ad that said live music is best and you totally agree. Um, live music is pretty awesome, yeah. All right, let's see what we have here in this. We just have a description here. Everyone knows the story of the Nutcracker. It's Christmas Eve and the beautiful, delicate, docile girl Clara is given an ugly, deformed nutcracker by her mysterious and frightening father-slash-lover, surrogate Drosselmeyer, loaded with Freudian implications and old king, new king symbolism. Her brother Fritz smashes its teeth. Drosselmeyer re-glues the nutcracker's jaw and Clara nurtures it, dreaming of the nutcracker fighting the evil mouse king, who is defeated when Clara hits the mouse king in the head with her shoe implying that her soul is no longer her own. Whereupon the Nutcracker turns into a handsome, of course, what other kind are there, philosopher king, formerly known as Prince, and sweeps Clara off to a romantic, albeit surprisingly platonic, adventure to the Kingdom of Confections, where they watch a bunch of candy dance, waltz with much ado and some carnations, and then she wakes up and it was all a dream. Get real. Since when can you indulge yourself to the fullest on cholesterol without guilt? Luxuriate in a grand limeration, lay the groundwork of a spectacular affair, which will no doubt lead to a committed, ongoing, monogamous, and individuated re relationship, or at least marriage. Perform selfless, heroic acts of aggressive and antisocial behavior, and be rewarded with the highest pleasures possible while consuming about a million empty calories, and then wake up and it was all a dream. Life is not like this. It doesn't go, it doesn't all go away when you wake up. So in the interest of honesty and art, Angels of the Next Generation is proud to present our version of the Nutcracker in a Nutshell, substituting some more modern imagery for the traditional story. <laughs> um, let's see. So we have a lot of like production notes. Uh, I don't know if I have the actual script for this. We'll see, because there's more. Uh, this is actually the showrun binder. This was a binder, and uh, it's no longer in the binder itself. It's just tied with some strings here. Uh, Angels of the Next Generation, Frank and Sensitive. Comic Christmas Carols, Portland, Scottish Rite Center. <clears throat> Let's see what we have. <laughs> the chord sheet. <laughs> that doesn't help me so much. Molly Crawley, Molly Crawley Christmas. All right. Witchcraft. I want to see which one I'm going to actually try to sing for you. <laughs> um, Santa's sweatshop. Nutcracker in a nutshell. <clears throat> The question is, do I remember the tune? <laughs> Green musical package is tied up with string. Uh, I don't know 
in my brain the tune for this one, so I might skip it. We, we read the kind of description there. <laughs> so instead of the March of the Sugar Plum Fairies, we have the March of the Armchair Quarterbacks. I, I'm not going to be able to sing this one, I don't think. Especially not with other songs playing in my ears. Uh, but uh, first down and ten yards to go. <laughs> Followed by three hours of college. Six of pro. Help me trim the tree. Come deck the halls. It's supposed to be the March of the Sugar Plum Fairies. Um, oh, jeez. A lot of the songs I get, I don't know the Nutcracker well enough to do this one in particular. Hang on. Oh, I could probably do this one. <laughs> so it starts with uh, engine revving. Haul out the Harleys. Oh, Lestra Oil, take my Lanta for the Take my land, take my lanta for the gas. Go to Betterly, get a hibiscus tattooed right across your ass now. <laughs> We're having a midlife crisis. <laughs> right? This very minute, we're paying for our vices. I, I'm not getting the tune. I'm sorry. I'm not going to be performing Christmas carols for you today while different Christmas carols play in my ear. It's kind of hard, but anyway, haul out the Harley. It's, it's a song about midlife crisis. Um, <laughs> let's see what else. I've got... I have a couple other of their shows here. Maybe one of those will work better and, and will successfully get a song out of me. Um, because it is surprisingly, surprisingly, unsurprisingly, rather difficult to get one of these tunes in my brain while I have other tunes playing in my ears. Uh... Angels the Next Generation. So this is uh, Bring Into Toys, Bring Into Bunk, which late 90s, there was a musical that started up called Bring In The Noise, Bring In The Funk, and they parodied it with Bring Into Toys, Bring Into Bunk. Um, I find just reading the lyrics sometimes to be a lot more <laughs> uh, okay, I think we might do this one. <clears throat> it's beginning to look a lot more racist everywhere you go. If you're driving through L.A. town and you're speeding and you're brown, they'll treat you like a king there, don't you know? It's beginning to look more homophobic. Fear behind closet doors. The most noxious thing to see is when Cincinnati, Maine, passes anti e uh, I've lost the tune there. It's when Cincinnati passes anti-equal rights laws. A pair of Storm's Trooper boots and an Uzi that shoots is the wish of Metzger. That's Tom. Creationist schools, fundamentalist rules is the hope of Maybon. That's Lon. And Bo, that's Gritz, can hardly wait for the Reich to rise anon. This is from the 90s. Uh, it's beginning to look a lot more classist. Bill size more flatulent. Keep your blue and pink collar down as you walk around the town. Yet at your own front door, measure 
59 says you're worth less than you are. I, I, so it's very pointed political commentary from 1998. Uh, originally written in 92, these lyrics were revised in 98 by Melinda Pittman. Um, and, and so it's pointed political commentary of the time. So uh, talking about Tom Metzger and Lon Mabon and Bogritz. Uh, who were political figures at the time. Um, and then later, it looks like uh, she was going to substitute in Fred Phelps. Um, there, yeah. <clears throat> There's uh, the next one in here is uh, Laramie Psalm, uh, which is specifically focused on Laramie, Laramie, Wyoming, and Matthew Shepard, and um, so more of like a hymn. Uh, the Man Who Let Me Lead. I don't know what song that one is spoofing. But basically, the albums that they actually put out uh, that you can find on um, like Spotify or Apple Music, etc., cetera, um, have these uh, parody Christmas carols. Um, hi, Scrap. I'm sorry. I'm not sure exactly when you got here. Uh, we're doing holiday-related items. I'm currently looking at materials from um, Melinda Pittman's theatrical collection, um, and she was involved in a couple of groups over the years in Portland, Oregon that did uh, political satire of Christmas carols for a holiday show um, that they used to do. And so we're looking at some of the lyrics from her political satire um, theatrical shows. Uh, come by my windows. <laughs> I, that, I'm not sure the tune on that one either. Um, but yeah, they're, they're quite fun. So if you do want to hear actual performances of them and, and kind of you're interested at all in late 90s political satire, uh, <laughs> It's definitely worth uh, checking them out. Like I said uh, before, their big show, the one that they won the award for was called Wonder Broads, The Babes and Broads Who Broke the Rules. Um, and that should definitely be available. Uh, to listen to. Yeah, I'm not I'm not a hundred percent certain. Uh it looks like the C D is probably available on Amazon. I'm not sure if it's on the streaming services or not, because I just did a Google search and um but you know. Uh so we will be Oh, um Christmas cards from the 1930s. Well, we are about to wrap up, but we can pull out a couple of, I don't know specifically if there are any from the 30s, uh, but we can, I can show off one more Christmas card before we go. Um, and then next week uh, will be holiday cocktails and mocktails, as I mentioned, and we will have Kira on as a special guest. Uh, but yeah, let's do one more, one more just like older Christmas card to... I don't know the date specifically, but we've got... Oh! 
Hannah, I hope that you enjoy your family Christmas on that day. And you know, if you do want to check out the cocktails and mocktails, though, there will be a VOD for you waiting. Um, so here we have a card. Uh, 1911, it looks like. 1910 to 1911. Uh, many blessings Christmas brings on its wide and glowing wings. May the brightest of them all on your path this season fall. Um, a lovely winter scene with some holly decorations, illuminated letters, uh, and then um, Merry Christmas 1910. I consider Farm Progress the best semi-monthly farm paper published and I'm having it sent to you for a year as a little remembrance. <laughs> I know you will enjoy reading it and you will find it very valuable to you in many ways. Happy New Year 1911. Uh, yep. <laughs> Not just a Christmas card, but an advertisement, too. <laughs> I was not quite prepared for the advertisement on that one, uh, which is funny because that's a lot of the ephemera stuff ends up being like that. Um, and I've got one second. <laughs> um, just one more here, and then we will call it for today. Um, I don't think I have that on my computer here. All right. Um, wish I could see dear Santa Claus. I'd give him something nice because he is so good to me and always trims my tree. Uh, so you've got some kids there, uh, one with a large candy cane, uh, one holding looks like sweet buns, and one with a uh, plum pudding, uh, bringing them over to Santa Claus. And it's blank on the back, I don't know the date, but um, it's going to be, again, early half of the 20th century. So, all right, uh, we are at 4.30, so that is the ending time for the stream. Um, we will, as I said, next week be doing holiday cocktails, but also mocktails. So um, feel free to join. I will have Kira Dietz on as a special guest. Uh, she is our expert in food history and um, cocktail history especially. So she will hopefully be able to explain to me what Tom and Jerry's is and why it exists. Um, so <laughs> thank you all for coming. Let me see uh, what we're going to do today. I don't know if there's any specifically... There's not anybody that I'm aware of that's on doing other holiday related things right now. So I think it is just going to be us going over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium again. It does look like they are doing the jellyfish cam today, so just uh, as a note, in case you don't want to see jellyfish. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and set up the raid for us over there to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, I hope that you join next week for our final stream of the year. Uh, as I said, cocktails and mocktails, and then we will be back on um, January 5th after a short break. Um, like, we're here next week, but then after that, January 5th, uh, for Australian Pulp Sci-Fi. Um, so I look forward to seeing you then. I hope that you enjoyed today, and um, yeah, I hope that you all have a good week. Yes, same time, uh, Scrap. Um, I hope that you all have a good week, and I hope that I see you next week. Uh, if not, I will see you again on January 5th for some Australian pulp sci-fi. Um, and if I don't see you next week, I hope that you have uh, happy holidays. Um, let me go ahead and switch up and we will raid very shortly. See you later.